Welcome to the Bibles.net podcast, where we have casual conversations with people whose ministries have changed our lives. Each episode, we introduce you to someone you'll want to meet, whose life and ministry can help you know and love Jesus better. We'll also answer a relevant question with a biblical answer and share with you some life-changing resources you'll want on your shelf. I'm your host, Eden, the editor of Bibles.net, who loves Jesus and believes he's the hope you need today. Coach Schweider, I'm so excited to talk to you today. I'm really thankful that you are just willing to interview with us and share a little bit about your life with Jesus and uh, your walk with him and what you've learned over the years. So thank you so much you for bet, being Ian. here today. You uh, bet, It's really great to be here, and I, I just consider it a privilege, and, and hopefully uh, God can use mm-hmm. our little discussion tonight to impact some lives. Yes, amen. Well, I'd love to uh, get to know you a little bit, so tell us a couple of things that bring you joy. Well, I guess there's a number of things, but I think the first thing that I would have to say that bring me joy is my salvation is secure. I used to go on the football field all the time for 43 years, and we'd be ready to start a practice, and it'd be a hot day, or sometimes it'd be a cold day, and or we'd gotten off of a loss, or be tough. I said, listen, guys, we all deserve hell, and we get heaven. You know, obviously at Wheaton College, yeah. they're, they're believers. And I looked out and I said, yeah. we deserve hell. And we get heaven. I mm-hmm. said, if we're not walking around with a smile on our face, who's going to be? Who really is? You yeah. know, we, by a decision yeah. we made, by a gift that was offered, and by a decision we made to accept that free gift and to secure heaven mm-hmm. when we deserve hell, man, that's, what's better than that? So ultimately... That's the thing that brings me the greatest joy, the greatest security, the greatest peace is my eternity has been already determined. And the God of this universe, uh, when I gave my heart to Jesus, the God of this universe has got a plan for my life. And in the end, we win. You know, as believers, we win because we get heaven. And no matter what happens to us. You know, I've said many times that everything happens for a purpose. It's for our good and God's glory. And one way I always looked at it this way, too, to sort of take a little sidetrack here to answer your question, Eden, is, you know, when we watch, when you watch a football game and you're watching it live, there's highs and there's lows and you ride up and down with the home team. You know what I mean? You're, you sort of ride that crest of emotions, you know, you're winning and then you're losing and you're nervous. And I said, but have you ever watched a game and it's a replay of a game? And you're watching the replay, and your team wins in the last second, and you're going through, and you just you just ride that wave because in the end, and you ride it so peacefully yeah. at comp, because in the end you win. Ultimately, that's yeah. that's what our our life, you know. And I know it's easier said than done, but ultimately, as believers, we do win. We get heaven, and that is secure. And our life is not random. And so that brings me yeah. great joy. It brings me great peace. And that would have to be the first thing. It's my eternity secure. My life is in the hands of an Almighty God, and uh, that gives me just yeah. tremendous peace. Um, the other thing that brings me great joy are my wife and my three children, and my two in-laws. And I'm going to have a third. My daughter's getting married in June. And. Uh, Yeah, all three of them are going to get married. And I have a wife who loves God, who's humble, Mm cause-driven, works at Wheaton Bible Church with children's ministries, doesn't have a selfish bone in her body, uh, loves me unconditionally, uh, Mm -hmm. has been an unbelievable mother, an example to my three children, raised them to walk Mm -hmm. with Jesus brings me great joy. I've never walked into the home and not walked into home and knew that I was going to be loved. And my home was always a soft mm-hmm. place to fall after a rough day. And then I have three wow. children that love God. I mean, I'm going to see my kids in heaven. I'm going to see my kids in heaven. I mean, that yeah. unbelievable joy. And my two sons married Christian girls. I'm going to see them in heaven. Mm-hmm. And my daughter is going to get married on June 5th to a Christian young man. I'm going to see him in heaven. Wow, you're talking about joy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what more could a man ask for than to have a wife and three children yeah. and then three in-laws that are all pursuing Christ? Um, it doesn't mean our yeah. lives have been easy. It doesn't mean we haven't gone through struggles. But the peace and the joy that can come from a secure eternity someday with all those that you love the most 
it really, really is, is, a, is a great joy. And then I think the third thing that would bring me joy is I was able to spend my life, I retired at 65, I'm 67 now, 43 years, I coached football. I was able to coach the thing I loved. Wow. I was able to use football, yeah. which was my greatest joy when you look at it in, as far as a, a sort of a secular joy. I was using these things that I love the most. Yeah. It was a passion of mine. It brought me the greatest joy here on, on earth when it comes to something here that's temporary. And I was able to do it 43 years and do it with success and impact lives. And, and I retired and they had a retirement celebration for me last August, or excuse me, last October. And I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds, I mean, five, 600 guys showed up from all over the country. And nobody, nobody talked about the wins and we won a ton of games. But you know what they did? They yeah. talked about the impact that the program had on their life. And I told mm -hmm. my wife, I went home that night. We didn't get home. We, the, the retirement celebration started at 6.30. We got home at three in the morning. And I said, you know what? Wow. The Lord can take me home and I can go to heaven. Because I realize now I didn't live my life in vain. As I heard those yeah. guys, and that brought me great joy to realize that they understood what I was trying to accomplish through the game of football for my entire life. Yeah. Wow. And you know, I, I find in my own life that it's so easy to look for that joy in the things that the world right. offers us. And we're constantly having all of these messages thrown at us. You know, if you, you know, if your job were different, if you look different, if, um, you know, the world is just sending us messages that we need to find our happiness here. And yet, like you said, when we find our joy in the next life, in life with Jesus and all that he's promised us, it actually adds value to the passing things of no this doubt. world. No, like no that, and, and the know, other you, thing that the joy comes from is, I've always said, it, you know, when I was at the retirement celebration and they had me speak to this group of, of men and I, I was telling them, I said, you know, life's about influence. <laughs> You know, you leave someone money yeah. and all they're going to do is spend it. You leave them wins and losses. All yeah. they're going to do is forget it. But what you leave inside yeah. somebody transcends your life. Mm -hmm. And life has yeah. to be about influence. You have to live no matter what the God, God calls you to do, to be in the business world or medicine or an airplane pilot or a homemade, whatever it is, we're supposed to be men and women of influence who are inspiring yeah. and encouraging and challenging and and, and, and helping others and, and, and making a difference in their life. And I, when I saw that at the retirement party, I, I said, if 1% of all you guys is Mike Swider, if just 1% is from the influence I had yeah. on you, it was worth it. And it yeah. brought me great joy to hear that that, that influence occurred. You know, that, you know, we won a ton of games yeah. and we got a lot of laughs. We watched some old videos. We got a ton of laughs and, and we did. I mean, we we won a lot of games, 80% of the games we've won, which is, which is an unreal record. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and that brings you great joy, but it's so temporary. It's yeah. so fleeting. And you know, in football, you, you win, well, that lasts you seven days. Then you got to win again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything that was long lasting. So yeah, I've been blessed. Yes. yes. Oh, well, um, is there a part of God's word that is especially precious to you? Yeah, there's a couple of verses always come to my mind. Yeah. Matthew 6.33 is one. I'll, I'll share two with you. Matthew 6.33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. But here's what we pursue first, all these other things. And you know what happens? We never find the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it doesn't mean that by seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that we're going to become wealthy and all these things. But you know what we're going to get? We're going to get what you talked about. Genuine peace and joy and happiness. And that's what it means that all these things will be added to you. We seek joy. We seek peace. We seek happiness. We think it's going to come from fame, money, wins, and all these things. And, and, and we never find the kingdom of God. And it says in Matthew, they seek ye first, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Live like he said to live. Follow his example. Look at the fruits of the spirit. You know, challenge yourself to, to make those your own. And if we really do pursue that, 
you know, we just talked about how your joy, your genuine joy is going to happen. And I'm going to tell you the other thing that God is going to bless your life too. He's going to bless your life. You're, it, I'm not going to say you'd be wealthy, but he's going to bless the things that you do. And so I yeah. think we got that backwards. I think what happens, we chase all those things, chase fame, money, power, and we, we seek them first. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. that we can't seek those things. I always speak to football coaches. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't want to win. Nobody, wanna, nobody wants yeah. to win more than I do. Nobody did. Nobody was a fierce competitor. Yeah. But that wasn't first. But seek hmm. ye first the kingdom of God. And, but we don't. We seek these hmm. other things first. It doesn't mean we yes. can't seek those things. But we got to seek first the kingdom of God. And then those things. Um, that, that verse has helped me keep my priorities aligned properly and, and given me joy. Uh, the other one is one that we, we read in, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It's a popular mm -hmm. one, but it, it's trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Boy, is that hard because we all, we want, you know, yeah. I'm going through a time right now. I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling because I, I just had a shoulder replacement. Uh, I had, Oof. I've had two shoulder surgeries in the last 12 months and wow. the first one failed. And this one now, the replacement now, it's a steel joint. There's not much more they can do, and it's not doing well. I'm just going to be right up honest oh. with you right now. And so I'm going through a time. I mean, I, I, my right arm here, I can't, I can't lift my arm without pain. It's been 12 months that I've been able to use it, really. And, and I've asked that question a thousand, why? And, and so yeah. I, one of the things I pray at night is a greater capacity to trust God. I don't pray for answers. Hmm. I pray for greater capacity to trust God. And so it says, trust in the hmm. Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding because you're not going to figure it out. You're, you're just not. Yeah. In all yes. your ways, acknowledge him as Lord and he will make your path straight. Hmm. I, and the way I've, I've learned to understand that better is as a father, I'll give you this example. My son would run into the street at five years old, little Mikey. Okay, Mikey would run into the street chasing a ball. And I'd grab him and i say, you can't do that. Okay, you can't do that, son. You're gonna get, and he looked at me and he cried and he, he didn't understand why I made his life difficult. So my first question was to him, I always say, Mikey, does daddy love you? Has your five years of life proven to you that I love you? And he, he'd get a snip and he goes, yes, daddy loves me. And then you know what I would say? Trust me, I know what I'm doing. What I'm doing is for your good. What I'm doing is not, I'm not receiving joy from inflicting this hardship. I'm trying to prepare you for a greater day. You have to trust me. Mm -hmm. The greatest act of arrogance is for a five-year-old to think he can understand a 40-year-old's mindset. Yeah. So yes. I go through a hard time. You were there when I went through one of my hard times, the whole hazing incident. Okay, yes. so I'm going oh, through this where so many things were being said and the accusations were coming out of left field and so unfounded. And I was going, I came home and I, I looked at my wife and I said, you got to be kidding me. And yeah. she says, you got to trust God. And I was in pain mm -hmm. like my son was. And she goes, and she, she got me. She goes, Mike, does God love you? Mm -hmm. and I said, yeah. She says, how do you know? I said, at that time, 64 years tells me he loves me. Just like I asked Mikey, five mm -hmm. years of my experience, said, last 64 years of my life proves God's love for me. And then she looked at me, she said, trust him. Mm -hmm. And when Mikey turned 10, he told me, thank you, dad, you saved my life. He understood. Wow. He understood why I did it. I haven't gotten to the point where I can say, I understand everything that God's done. Even now, and someday, I mean, we might not understand everything until we get to glory. But I understand a lot of things that have happened in my life two, three, four, five years down the road. And that's why that verse yes. says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding at that moment. Acknowledge him and yeah. he's going to make your path straight. And, yes. and so, you know, my players would always say, you know, the older I get, the smarter you get, coach. As my players would come back at the retirement, the older I'm, I'm 40 now, you're, you're, you're so much smarter. I, I understand everything. And you know what? Yeah. The older I get, the smarter God gets. <laughs>
Yeah. And I understand Amen. more and more as I get older. So those verses have been verses that have really helped me keep my rudder straight. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I love that you picked those verses specifically because I think those are some of the most like Googled verses in the Bible, yeah. some of the most well known. And yet it's just proof that God's word never gets old yeah. and it, it never fades in its, um, you know, brilliance and it, you know, it never diminishes in power just because it's familiar. No, not at all. And no. um, that those lessons that you just expressed, like learning to trust God when we don't understand what's going on, that's something that you just learn over and over and over Absolutely. and that you just keep coming back to it. And like I was saying that trust, Eden, you're not trusting this inanimate object. You're not trusting you're trusting a God yeah. who loves you so much he sent his son to die for you. Yeah. I, I, I use the example all the time. Like, you know, when I was coaching too, I would get my son over when I was coaching him. I said, if 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 I took my son and had my son die so that you could live, I looked at my 80, 90 players, would you trust any other action I took towards you? It is, oh, totally. oh my gosh. You, 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 you just gave us your son. And and that's what God has done. It, yeah. it, the love and so we, we're we're trusting a god who loves us yeah amen and i think that it's good to remember that all of scripture is really centered on jesus absolutely. and without jesus he's the point of the bible absolutely. he's he's the fulfillment to all these promises all these verses that we cling to are ultimately helping us find our hope in him he's our conduit to place. heaven he's our you know without jesus we can't pray to god i mean someone had a we were we were sinners in, in the Old Testament. You know, There's no conduit to God. You know, you had to go through a high priest who would have shed a blood of a lamb. And Jesus yes. came as that eternal sacrifice. And now we have this. We can talk to our, our God, and we have a, yeah. we have conduit to Him. And you're right. Jesus is He's the key to everything. He's the key to heaven. Yes. Yeah. So tell us a little about um, football. Yeah. So, um, heard a little bit about your. I typically ask, what ministry are you involved in? And you're retired now, but tell us a little bit how um, Jesus led you to football yeah. in your ministry at Wheaton College. Yeah, well, my dad was a high school football coach, and 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 he, he it's all he ever knew, and he coached, and I saw the impact and the influence he had. Mm. You know, and I, my dad died early. He he retired, and um, he, he he died within months after he retired. He got cancer, and he died fast. And uh, at his funeral, I saw and I heard and letters were sent and I realized that, whoa, this guy impacted a lot of people, man. And mm -hmm. he never made a wooden nickel, never made anything, but his influence and his impact was enormous, enormous. And he was a, he was a high school football coach in the city of Chicago in the Chicago public school system which was, it's a difficult environment to be in. It, it has its yeah. set of challenges. Yet I saw the impact he had. And even to this day, people will, guys that he coached, will see my name and say, hey, was did you have a dad named John Swider Sr.? I said, yeah. He said, wow. whoa, he, he changed my life. Oh. And then you just go, whoa. Well, anyhow, I was hearing that when I was, you know, I was seeing that when I was growing up. And I said, you know, this is what I want to do. Besides the fact that I just love football, I love, I, I've, mm -hmm. I've said this, there, it's the, to me, it was, it's the greatest sport in the world. And you asked one of your questions when we prepped for this was, you know, how, how can you use football and how does it relate to your faith and how can you connect it? The reason why I say it's the greatest sport in the world, not because inherently it's better than other sports, but no other sport requires so many to die to themselves and live for something bigger. Huh. The individual sports thought. require none of that. Um, yeah. But other team sports, they don't have 120 guys in a roster. Well, yeah. for us to achieve, those 120 guys have got to die to themselves. And what's yeah. got to drive them is the team winning. What drives you can't be me playing, me being great. What drives you has to be the team winning. You've got to die to yourself and live for something bigger if that sport's going to succeed. And that's a difficult thing because we're all egocentric. You know, kids, I want to play. I want to win. I, 
you know, I, I, I'll, I'll never forget, you know, our freshmen would come into my office and they, with their parents and I'd be recruiting them. I said, what do you want to do when you come? He says, I want to play. I want to start. And I said, well, I want to win. Until you want to win first, we're, we're going to be the same. We're not going to look at anything the same way. You know, yeah. you're, everything's going to be yours. I want to play. I'm going to do everything. I want to play. Where I'm going to look at big picture, I want to win. And well, for us to win, that... you got to die to yourself. Yeah. And I'd look at the parents and I'd say, would you rather your son start on an eight and two team or sit the bench on a 10 and 0 team? And every parent would say, I'd rather him start on an eight and two team because I want to see him play. Wow. And I, I, I understood it. Yeah. I said, but you know, here's the problem. I want to be 10 and 0. So you're not looking yeah. at it through the same lens and you're going to have to, you're going to have to change that lens. You got to, yeah. if, if your son's going to be part of something big, he's got to die to himself. And so I would use that with these young men, first and foremost, for marriage. You got to yeah. die to yourself and live for that team of two. Eden, I was mm -hmm. single for 35 years. Every single decision I made was what's best for me. And I don't mean immoral yeah. decisions. I mean, what, what I want for dinner, what church I want to go to, what service I wanted to go to, what movie I wanted to watch. I mean, just general yeah. life decisions. They were all what's best for me. Hmm. The moment I got married, I had to die to myself. And you know what I said? It's what's best for us. But see, yeah. If I make decisions on what's best for me, us dies in the vine. And you have a child. It's what's best for three of us. Two children, what's best for four of us? Three. And so I tell these young men, I says, you got to die to yourself if you want that team to win. You got to die to yourself and live for the bigger cause. Isn't that what Jesus asked us to do ultimately? To die to ourselves and live for the cause of Christ. Yeah. To die to ourselves and realize that this is a, we are put on earth not to, you talked about it earlier, not for self-gratification. That's not why we were put on earth. We are put on earth to give glory to God, to give glory to God, to praise his name and further the kingdom. That's our purpose for being on this earth. And yeah. until we die to that purpose, we're never going to find true meaning. And football, like no other sport, it forces a young man to understand that it's not about him. It's about a mm -hmm. bigger picture. And in our culture, that's hard to swallow. This this younger generation, we're going. We were talking about earlier about self gratification, instant gratification. Yeah. We can talk about it here in a minute, Eden. But in this generation, it's all about me, 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 and now, now, now. Yes. Can't so be that true. way. You're never going to be married successfully. You're never going to be part of any organization successfully. You're never going to be able to yeah. function as a believer if that's the way you look at it. Yeah. Wow. Football might become my favorite sport <laughs> after you. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think we were talking earlier about how we think we're going to find joy in this world, but we really find it when we find it in Christ. And I think we come to the place of, you know, being faced with whether we'll die to ourselves. And that seems like a loss. But Jesus also tells us, you know, that unless a grain of wheat falls and dies, it will never bear fruit, right? Unless a seed is buried in the dirt and goes right. through that death, it's never going to come to life. And, um, you know, as a believer, as someone who has faith in Jesus, I have found that when we do submit our lives to his plan and to, um, you know, to the, to the team goals that Jesus has set, exactly. we have so much more joy when we experience a win, right? When a prayer is answered or when uh, we see, see someone join the team, it's, you know, it's, it's a joy so much bigger. Yeah. And the other thing, when you die to yourself, see, die to yourself is, is, it's what you described. And it's well, also, it's, it's when you die to yourself, you serve. See, it's, yeah. you know, that's what we're called as Christians to, to serve, to mm. serve. We're called to be servants, to serve. And, and that's another thing in football. It's, it's, you're part of something that, you know, the, the lineman got a block. I mean, you're, you're, you're called to these little tasks for so for someone else to be successful. Yeah. And you have yeah. to serve. And guess what? Dying to yourself not only means dying to your own ambition, but you, the way you die to yourself is you look at someone and say, what can I do to help you? Hmm. How can I help you? What can yeah. I do for you? As Jesus did, how can I wash your feet? You know, hmm. the greatest leaders are servants. You follow yeah. people who serve you. 
You know, you don't yes. follow people who rule you. You follow people who serve you. <laughs> yeah. And and that's how dying to yourself is. It, it's it's you become someone who's who people want to be around when you're selfless, when you're cause driven. You become mm-hmm. someone that people gravitate towards rather than an egocentric person that you, you don't you're, you're not gravity you don't gravitate towards that person and so yeah. when you die to yourself and serve and live for a bigger cause you're not any further the kingdom but people flock to you yes yeah and that gives you so much like purpose i think everyone's looking for kind of a sense of you know what do i do like there's so many things vying for my attention and my time how do i live a meaningful life and it's like you serve others. You love, you love God. You love others. And that will fill your life. Absolutely. Um, no doubt. It will take you time. It will give you joy. And ultimately, I think that's a blessing of being in Christ is the call is pretty simple. Love yeah. other people and love the Lord. Well, I do these and, leadership talks. And one of the things I might speak to men in a business, I speak into a business group when we're talking about leadership. Mm-hmm. You know, I talk about being a servant leader. And I said, you know, the great leader, he walks into the office every day or wherever it is, and he looks, as he walks in, he goes by the desk, wherever he says, he, he asks somebody, what can I do to help you? How can I help you mm-hmm. today? Every day you should be saying that to someone. How can I help you? What can I do for you? You need anything today? And if you're, mm-hmm. if the guy's your boss, your leader is ask, is is submitting himself to your desire, how can I serve you today? <laughs> That's an attractive quality, man. And I'll tell you, that's somebody you're going to follow. But that's yeah. always dying to his own ego. And it's wow. just, you don't see it. You see people rule people rather than serve people. So true. So true. Wow. Well, um, I have another question for you. Yeah. So you've talked, I've heard you speak uh, in chapel about kind of being a person of conviction. Yeah. And... So we live in a world where, you know, there's opinions out the wazoo being thrown around. How would you counsel someone if they said, I want to become a person of conviction? How would you answer that? Oh, great question. Well, I would first ask, who do you fear? Hmm. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But we live in a culture that fears man. Yeah. We worry about what people think. You yes. know, when our kids are in junior high, we say, don't worry about it's peer pressure. You know, yeah. are you going to do that? Because that's the expectation, which is like fear. Well, if a 50 year old experiences peer pressure, everyone does. I mean, it. Yeah. do you fear God or do you fear man? If you fear man, your life will morph and change to whatever environment you find yourself in. Whatever social group you're in, if you fear man, you're gonna fear the opinions and the ideas of that little social group. I see in politicians all the time, they speak to the veterans of foreign wars, they say this. They speak to Hollywood, they say this. They speak to the Teamsters Union, they say this. Now wait, Hmm. the one who's really attractive, he says the same thing regardless of who he's talking. Yeah. lives the same way regardless of where he's living because his fear is not of man meaning of the person he's living with or speaking to his fear is of god and i yeah. say this all the time i'll speak to spoken to five six seven hundred people a thousand people a few times and and i'll go and i'll start when i talk I said to be honest with you guys i don't really care what you people think of me yeah. and i said you know what because the back side of this meeting is tomorrow you know what? I worry about what God thinks because the backside of that meeting is eternity. And I look at the group and I say, someday, I look out at the group, everyone in this room is going to see God. We all, we cannot deny it. Mm-hmm. Someday, we're all going to see God. If we lived our life in light of that meeting, we would mm-hmm. be men and women of conviction. Yeah. But we don't. We don't live life in light of that meeting. I use this example all the time. We have two days in our life that are guaranteed. Two days, Eden. Today, this day, and that day. Those are the only two days we got. This day, yeah. today we're living. This is guaranteed because we got it. 
Hmm. Only another guaranteed day we got is that day we see Jesus. Yeah. It's another guarantee you got. If we live today in light of that day, you would live differently. Yes. You would live and be a man and a woman of conviction because you knew that's the other day you got. Yeah. If you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, would you worry about what people thought of you? Absolutely. Would you worry and you would you bend and drop your morals and your conscience and say things? And if you knew you were going to see God tomorrow, nobody would. Nobody yeah. would. So and true. that's how we got to live. We got to live that way. And, you know, I know my dad died. He was 63. And and before I turned 63, I used to use this example all the time. I say, if I die the same time my dad died, I'm living six months. Wow. And I go, you think I'm worried about what you people think of me? I'm living yeah. six months. You guys don't even matter. I'm seeing God in six months. Yeah. You know, yeah. if I die the same time I did, well, here's the reality, Eden. We could die tomorrow. Right. Every one of us could. Yeah. If we live today in light of that day, we would be men and women of conviction. Because you know what we yeah. do? We're going to fear. And I don't mean necessarily be afraid. We fear God because we're going to be accountable to God yes. on that day. Yeah. The backside of our meeting with anybody we see, you know, in any social backside of that meeting is tomorrow. It's the next. Yeah. It's it's it's, it's irrelevant. Right. And so I think that that's if we're going to be men and women of conviction and of principle, we live our lives based on the absolutes and the truth that comes only from Scripture. The God yes. of this universe who put the stars in the sky is the maker and the teller of truth. Live your life fearing him and abiding by his words mm -hmm. and you'll be men and women of conviction worry about what people think you'll you'll mortgage everything and you'll morph and become a chameleon that adapts to his environment and has no backbone and no spine yes yeah and you know i as you were saying that i was thinking of how people do say oh you only live once you know you're only young once so you know live your life you know they they act like Oh, I've only got today, but what we have lost is the fact that we will face God. Right. Absolutely. And if if that were if that fear of God were restored, we would be really different people, right. I think. The reality of death. You know, but the reality of it is just and I don't mean that we be, living in the reality of death makes you you know, this this person who's fear it it allows you to live totally free. Because you don't yeah. worry about what everybody's thinking. You know what you do? You just live. And you yeah. make a stand and you make your statements and you it it, it 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 frees you up to be a man of principle and and abide by those things because it it those people and the opinions of the world are become irrelevant. Yes. And now you said a little bit about scripture, but so let's say I, I just heard you and I'm thinking, well, but how do I like keep that in my memory like how day to day do i remember that i'm living before god is there way is there a way to grow in the fear of the lord yeah oh I, I got a great one for you i don't know if it's scripture but it's a biblical concept that you can remember okay here's here's when we fail when we forget the cost of our salvation yeah you're a believer yeah. and you forget what jesus did for you you forget the cost that was paid so you get heaven. You forget that. And it's like I, I gave that example to you. If I And I would use it from football all the time with my son. I would take my son. I put him next to me on the football field, a devotional at the end of practice. And I would say, okay, you 120 guys, you're all condemned death row because of what you've done. You sinned. The penalty for sin is death. But I got a plan. And my son, Justin, he's in on his plan. And here's our plan. Justin is going to die. And he's going to take, he's going to be, he's going to die. And his shed blood will release all you guys. And you now are free to walk. And he, and then I, has got his father, watch my son get beaten beyond human recognition. Mm -hmm. Suffer the most brutal death you could ever imagine. So Eden, so you can live. My son Justin died, so you could live. Think of it that way. He dies. My, you know Justin. You know Mikey. They die. You live. Hmm. Here's my thing. Would you ever forget that I did that for you? No. 
and you walk around for the next 50 years, would you ever forget that Coach Swider sacrificed his son for you? Yeah, Would you ever absolutely. forget that? No. Would you ever be ashamed to talk to me? No. Would you ever be ashamed to claim me? No. Would you ever not think I loved you? No. Would you ever not trust something I did towards you, a motive? No. no. You, yeah, you'd give anything. You'd give yeah. your life for that. Yeah. You, you, would, you would pray to me. You would read my word. You'd trust me. You'd stand up for me. You'd claim me publicly. And yeah. so here's what happens. Mm -hmm. Never forget the cost of your salvation. And you know what mm -hmm. happened? You'll live differently, too. Yeah. Wow, that's You'll incredible. live differently. Yeah. You, you will. Yes. that's the reality of it. And you will not yeah. forget our maker. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, I think of when Jesus says those that have been forgiven much will love much. Yeah. And you know, when Absolutely. we keep that, I have been forgiven so much love will just flow out of us. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah because you realize what you deserve and you don't get it. And, and, Man, if God can love me like that, absolutely. Wouldn't yeah. you want to, again, push other people to have that same joy that we have based on yeah. the security of our eternity? Yeah. We would love love them, love them to heaven. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, thank you. I mean, that's given me things to think about. That's going to change <laughs> my week, <laughs> thinking about this. What is a book or... Um, maybe a resource that has really helped you grow in your walk with Christ over the years, something that you would say, Hey, this resource has transformed me. And I think yeah. everybody should read this book. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one that my wife and I just read here in the last couple when I retired, we read it together. I've had more time, obviously now I'm retired. And so my yeah. wife, we're starting to read these books by Jerry Bridges and mm. um, he's great. He's really great. And he's, you know, he's got a, pursuit of holiness but the one that you know is, is that we the first one we read together was trusting god okay and it really changed me it mm -hmm. really did it affected me deeply um you know as a type a I'm, you know i was a i'm type a guy I, i'm just highly driven highly motivated you know i could will I, I used to give these football talks to at football clinics i would say to a group of coaches i would go there's 22 players out there. I'll give, I'll give me the first pick. You take the next 11 and I'll take the last 10. I'll beat you 80% of the time. Wow. And they'll go, and they'll go, why? I says, because my players will play harder for me than your players will play for you. I promise wow. you, my players will play harder for me than yours will play for you. And I just said, I could will and inspire more than anybody else could. I mean, I'm just driven. If, if, if you and I have to lay in a hot tar roof and the first one who gets off loses, you will lose. Because I'll lay there longer than you will. I believe it. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no way. I will. You, you'll get off before I get off. I can endure more than you. And that's just the way I'm wired. And, and so that kind of person thinks he can, no matter how tough and hard and confusing, I will will myself through this. Yeah. Well, you know what? You can't. You can't yeah. do everything that way. And I'm finding out with the shoulder thing right now. It's There's certain things you can't do like that. Yeah. And you got it. There, there, things happen in your life. And if if the only solution you have is your own human flesh, you can't get through it. Yeah. You cannot you cannot will yourself through it because you can't you don't understand why it's happening. And mm -hmm. then frustration overcomes you and and all these things. And that was really hard for me because I just you know, and, and the other thing that it, it, it really balanced in me is and, and I had things out of order. When, when a hard time came, I always said, I will outwork anybody. And then I, so I got to work. The first thing that happened, I said, I'm getting to work. Okay, mm -hmm. something happened. I'm getting to work right now. And then after a couple of days, I said, man, I better pray about this too and incorporate God. Well, you read that book. First thing you do is you get on your knees. Yeah. And you pray. Yeah. You pray first and then you work. There's a lot of people that'll just pray. You know, and then they say, well, I'm just going to pray and leave it up to God. And I'm just going to sit back and whatever he says happens. That's yeah. just as bad as the guy who was like me. who says, I'm going to work first and incorporate God last. Right. Well, this book really inspired me to say the first thing that's got to happen is you got to get on your knees and you got to get in touch with the maker and say, Lord, I need your help. And you got to trust him that the mm -hmm. circumstance that is there was put there by him for a purpose. Yeah. Lord, help me to understand that purpose and make it through this and then get to work. 
That book is really good. The premise is everything occurs for our good and his glory. Every wow. single thing that happens, once you become a believer, yeah, in every single thing that happens to you is happening for his glory and for our good. And if you really internalize that, you know what? It'll affect the way you live. Yeah. And it's not been easy, but it, it's 66 years old is when I read it. It really, really helped me because I, I get so angry and I get so frustrated. I say, no, there's purpose in this. Yeah. I'm a child of God and this is not a random act. This is not yes. a random occurrence. It's yeah. purpose. Trust God through this purpose. Hmm. And get to work and, and find out what it is. So, wow. Yeah. That's a great book. Uh, trusting, trusting God by Jerry Bridges. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a whole series of books that he has that are really good. Yeah, he's a great author. Yeah. Well, I so appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being willing to just share about your walk with the Lord and share with us so much encouragement. Um, yeah. I know that that has God has even used that just in our talk to really challenge me, and so I'm just so thankful for your time. Well, Ian, I, I appreciate it, and I, I'm blessed and I'm honored that you called me to we can sit down and have this little discussion these are things that I do much more now that I'm retired I've been able to do a lot more of these because I have the time now and it's like a, a new little ministry for me thank you so much for listening to our podcast today if you enjoyed our conversation I would encourage you to like or subscribe to our podcast so that you can hear the next conversation and if something that you heard today spoke to your heart or got you thinking, I would encourage you to not let the day go by without talking to God about what's on your mind. We believe that he loves you and that he's pursuing you today out of that love. 